I mean, prepare. Be live. Hey guys, Assalamualaikum everyone. Hope you're all having a great Saturday afternoon. Welcome back to another series of, uh, another series of Secret Tech series. And today's class is about knowing the path to Allah. And this class is based on Sheikh Ibn Arabi Sahih's uh, magnum opus. In this book, it's a manual for those on their spiritual journey to Allah, for them to know themselves and know Allah. And this is the third episode being taught by uh, Imam uh, Talud Daud. Let me just read a bit about him. So Imam Talud is a student of knowledge from the United States who has studied Arabic and the religion for over 10 years. He specializes in Arabic translation and Hanafi fiqh. He currently resides in Mexico where he has taught and served as Imam for the last six years. And he is a murid and authorized muqaddam of Sheikh uh, Muhammadu Mahi Sisi. So with that, um, I would like to uh, invite Imam Talud Daud to uh, commence the class. Assalamualaikum, uh, Imam Talud. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Audhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillahi ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Maliki yawm al-Din. Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad al-Fatih lima ugrika wal khatim lima sabaka nasir al-haqi bil-haqi wal-hadi ila siratika al-mustaqim wa ala alihi haqa qadri wa mikdari al-azim Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima tu'allimuna wa zidna bin fadlika ilma wa ta'liman innaka ala kulli shay'in qadir Rabbana atina min nadunka rahmatan wa hayyirina min amrina urashada. Ya himmati shaykhi ahlilunana bihada al-mahtada al-kutifi ibnina al-azim ta'ati ilana bil-kufar. Okay, bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, we are going to start inshallah. Um, before we start, uh, there was a question last week um, about how to know when a notion, when something that comes to you is from Allah. And I said that I would uh, answer it based on uh, Sidi uh, Ahmed Zarouk's text on the matter. And uh, so I will answer that first before we get started. So um, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk says that there are, um, there are four different types of notions, four different types of thoughts. The first is divine without any intermediary. The second is the, from the nafs. The third is an angelic notion or thought. And the fourth is from shaitan. And each of them only uh, obeys the, the command or the, the qudra, the power and the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the, the way that you know the difference is that the, the divine notion is something that comes to you without any doubt, without any uh, misgiving. It doesn't come and you and you deliberate on it. It's something that comes to you and, and you are sure about it. The nafsani is something that comes to you um, and, and, and they, they, they seem to be similar. However, nafsani uh, will be only about that which has to do with worldly desires. So it will be about, you know, the things that you want in this world. The, the, the Lord lead or the divine will be about things that are completely in, in conformity with the, the sacred law, or it will be about um, Tawheed. It will be about, you know, the, the um, understanding of Allah's divine oneness. And these notions will come to you and, and you will be sure about it without any doubt whatsoever. And the nafs, these things, the, they, the, if you get a notion that is not about the desires of the nafs, then it will be something that you uh, deliberate about or you're not sure about. So you can discard that as nafsani. And the, uh, sh the maliki has to do with obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It will never be anything else. So it's always obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the shaitani is always uh, disobedience 
to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, um, except in a few cases where he can try to inspire you to obedience for the sake of trying to trick you. However, you know, the, this, you will know the difference because, because it's accompanied, uh, as uh, Sheikh Zarouk says, it's accompanied by heat and by discomfort. And so that, that's the answer. What is from Allah will be, it will be accompanied by coolness and contentment. And it will be something that you are absolutely sure about. And what comes from other, other sources will either be something that you're not sure about or it'll be something that you um, will give you um, some, uh, will give you some, some, uh, bad feeling or some some uh unsure be, it's a, make you unsure about yourself or about what you're doing and the angelic will always be about obedience to allah and call it to, calling to what is good and uh you, you you also know because what is from allah and what is from the angels is strengthened by dhikr and by ibadat and by worship of allah by remembrance of allah Worshiping Allah by fasting, these things strengthen what is from Allah and what is from the angel. And what is from shaitan or the nas is weakened by those things. And what is from shaitan and the nas is strengthened by disobedience to Allah. And so this is how you know, you know the difference between what is from Allah and what is not from uh, Allah. So I hope that, that uh, makes it uh, clear. Uh, there were also some questions about uh, hidden knowledge, ilm al batin, and how that differs from the batiniya. And actually, this first section of the book is all about that. And so we will read this section. We'll explain, you know, some different parts. And and still, if there's still some some uh, doubt, then we can address that question again, inshallah. So the sheikh started out by saying that is, you know, there are two types of knowledge. There is, uh, um, there is apparent knowledge or external knowledge, which has to do with the rulings of the sacred law and how to put, put uh, what Allah, the commands of Allah in practice. And then there's hidden knowledge and hidden knowledge is of two types. The first type is principles of the science of human relations. Um, so it's the underlying uh, states of the heart the knowledge of the underlying states of the heart behind all of these acts that we are trying to put into practice. And that, that's the first type of, uh, of uh, uh, hidden knowledge. So I'm gonna jump right in and, and start reading inshallah. And, and uh, if there's anything to clarify, I will clarify. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. So Sidi uh, Al-Arabi Ibn Sayh says, as for hidden knowledge, it is of two types. The first type is principles of the science of human relations. Its reality is the study of the purification of the heart and disciplining the soul by, by being on guard against blameworthy conduct, which the sacred law has censured, such as showing off conceit, love of status, praise, and prestige, so that it may be characterized by praiseworthy conduct, conduct such as sincere devotion, gratitude, patience, abstinence and contentment. So the first uh, first type of uh, hidden knowledge has to do with how to deal with the different uh, character traits or character flaws that we have and how to correct them so that we may develop, uh, develop pure and good character traits and uh, or character virtues. And so it's, uh, it's all about getting rid of our, our character flaws and replacing them with character virtues. And so the, the knowledge is uh, it's the knowledge of how to accomplish that. As we'll see, he's gonna, he's gonna, um, he's going to, to explain that um, in a few paragraphs, inshallah. Um, this is so that he may be rectified when he had been firmly established in that because of his acting upon what he knows so that he may inherit what he did not know. His knowledge without action is a means without an end. 
while its opposite is a crime. So acting, uh, having knowledge without action is like, is basically um, having all the money in the world, but not being able to do anything. Um, it's having the means to act, but you don't act. And act, acting without knowledge is, is haram, is haram. This is, this is unlawful. And they're coming together without constraint is discomfort without a payoff. And so you, um, if you act upon your knowledge without restraining your uh, lower self, then this is a, um, this is, this is a, a um, you're, you're acting and your, your uh, actions go unrewarded is basically what he's saying. So the most important matter is abstinence and rectitude so that he may benefit from his knowledge and his action. Then this type of is an individual obligation for the preservation of the scholars uh, of the hereafter. So the one who rejects it will perish by the power of the king of kings in the hereafter, just as the one who rejects outward action perishes by the sword of the worldly rulers according to the ruling of the jurist of the world. And so um, basically he's saying that this, this uh, knowledge of um, replacing car character flaws with character virtues is uh, an obligation upon every Muslim. The second type is unveiled knowledge. It is a light that manifests in the heart when the soul has been purified and then manifests by it comprehensive meanings and by it the possessor of it contains uh, the possessor of it attains intimate knowledge of Allah exalted is he his name his attributes his books his messengers and the veils uh, and the veils to hidden secrets are lifted from, from him so understand and submit so that you will be safe and do not be among those who deny this and thereby perish with those who are doomed to perdition Regarding this type, some of the knowers of God said a bad ending is feared for the one who does not have a portion of this knowledge. The, so, the smallest portion of it is confirmation of it and submitting to its people and or showing deference to its people. And so we, we ask Allah to give us um, deference to the people of, of uh, Ma'rifah and the people of, of uh, intimate knowledge of him and to confirm their knowledge if we cannot attain what they attained. And Allah knows best. And, and he says, see Irshad is sadi, or, um, which means that um, this discussion has been, uh, he has taken this discussion from uh, this book and summarized it. He continues, moreover, hidden knowledge of both types is the ut utmost limit of acting upon apparent knowledge its essence, as well as the outcome that is sought from it and its fruit. So um, basically hidden knowledge is not something that is, uh, okay, something that somebody has without, uh, without effort or something that, that uh, somebody knows uh, because of some special characteristic that they have. No, hidden knowledge is basically uh, what we're gonna see is basically that a person obeyed Allah and Allah taught him what he did not know. Um, he, he taught him things that he had not known. Um, and that is because when the slave acts according to the sacred law and stops at its prescribed limits by observing its specified conditions and its known etiquettes his heart will undoubtedly be illuminated by the grace of Allah with the lights of belief. And it will produce for him in the hidden realm, rare sciences and etiquettes whose modality cannot be described and astonishing secrets of realities and experiential knowledge. Thus he will come to know sciences and etiquettes of the sacred law that minds cannot comprehend. And he will realize lordly secrets of divine gnosis that will bewilder the minds of the onlookers. Then the real knower of hidden knowledge is the one that is indicated by the sheikh and knower of Allah 
Sidi Abdul Wahab Shaarani, may Allah exalt it as he be pleased with him. In his book, Yawaqit uh, al-Jawahir fi Bayan Aqaid al-Kabir, in the 48th section, he says, you should know that the real Sufi is a jurist without exception. The accomplished Sufi is a jurist without exception. And he's going to explain this. Um, it does not mean that a Sufi, who accomplished Sufi, who is not a scholar of sacred law, knows fiqh all of a sudden. That's not what it means. Um, it's, he's going to explain it. Um, but basically, he becomes a person who is able to derive the rulings of the path of Allah, the, the path of tasawwuf from the Quran and Sunnah is what is what it means. So he becomes a jurist because he is like the people, the jurist, the fuqaha, who derive the rulings of the sacred law from the Quran and Sunnah. So the Sufi is the person who derives the rulings of the path of Allah from the Quran and Sunnah. That that is the uh, the accomplished Sufi, according to uh, Abdul Wahhab Shahrani. May Allah be pleased with him. So he says, you should know that the real Sufi is a jurist without exception, and Allah causes him to inherit the discovery of subtle intricacies and secrets of the sacred law until he becomes a mujtahid in the path, and the secrets uh, um, in the path and the secrets just as it. Uh, a mujtahid of the path and of the secrets, just as is the place of the mujtahid imams, of the jur the imams who are mujtahid. Mujtahid is um, a person who is able to derive rulings um, from the sacred law and is of different levels and that's beyond the scope. But basically when you see, when you hear mujtahid, is someone who can derive rulings either of the sacred law or of tasawwuf. That's, that's the context of this book. So just as, as, just as is the place of the mujtahid imams and the branches of the sacred law. For that reason, they stipulated in the path obligations and prohibitions and praiseworthy and blameworthy matters. But unlike the former, just as the mujtahids of the path had derived such rulings and they had invalidated worship and beliefs that violated what they had obligated, what they had obligated or made a condition thereof or wherein what they had forbidden was committed. And that is their matter. Allah exalted, Allah, may Allah exalted as he be pleased with them. There's not among them anyone for whom uh, there has been firmly established in, uh, who has been firmly established in sainthood, except that he is a mushtahid in the path, not following anyone except in what has been explicitly stated in the sacred law or what the ummah has agreed upon. So whoever claims the station of completion and follows someone else, he is not truthful. So um, basically what he's saying is everybody, you know, the, the mushtahid imams, they derive rulings of the sacred law. The, the, the accomplished Sufis derive the rulings of the path from uh, directly from the Quran and the Sunnah. And so you, that's where the people of the path said for my murids, this is obligatory. They weren't making a new law. Uh, they were saying, uh, this, is, this is the path of Allah and I derive this ruling for my murids in the path of Allah. And so it's not, it's, it's not the same, uh, it's, it's comparable, but it's not the same. And deference in all matters is paid to the mujtahid imams, except in the, mat, in the matter of the path of Allah. And so um, he's, he said that no, um, anyone who becomes realized on the path becomes a mujtahid. So anyone who claims completion and follows someone else is not truthful. So the, um, the accomplished Sufi, he, you know, he follows the Quran and Sunnah directly 
except where you know the the imams uh, command something that is directly stated in the Quran and Sunnah, or where the Ummah is uh, has ijma, so they will never go against ijma. Uh, and this has also been discussed in the books of uh, Sidi Ahmed Zarouk uh, at length. He also said, and I heard Sidi Ali al Khawas at various times say, a man is not complete according to us until t he takes his knowledge from where the mujtahids took it. So a, a Sufi does not become complete until he takes his knowledge directly from the Quran and Sunnah. Now this, this is, uh, you know, this may sound like it's uh, saying that they don't have to follow the, the madhabs and stuff like that. Um, basically, if something is explicitly stated in in the um, in the uh, Quran and Sunnah, and the Imams give that ruling, then they have to follow the Imams in that. If if there's ijma, if there is consensus of the Ummah, then they have to follow the Imams in that. If there is uh, something that is mu'tamad. Um, uh, like in the in the Hanafi madhab or mashhur in the Maliki madhab, something that is is the relied upon opinion in the land in the land, then if he if the the accomplished Sufi feels that something else is the is the correct answer, then he may act upon that in his private dealings, but in his in public. And when he teaches and things like that, then he should give what is the relied upon position. Otherwise, he may be sinful. You know, so th this is not it's not a get out of jail free card. It's not a or the the Arifin no best. No, uh, they become people who are able to derive the rulings, you know, and they become in some sense, uh, mujtahids. However, that is limited um, and they still must observe the etiquette uh, that is expected of them from, from the point of view of the sacred law. He also said, and I had heard, um, he, he mentioned something similar in the muqaddimah of his tabaqat. He's, he's uh, actually quote, um, talking about Imam al-Sha'rani again. And the uh, tabaqat of Imam Shaurani and his muqaddima, his his introduction, uh, um, he mentions something similar, and then said, "However, only the one who dives into the depths of the sciences of the sacred law until he, until he reaches his, his limits is honored to realize that the science of tasawwuf is a branch of the sacred law itself." So here is the here is the 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 meat of what we want to get to. So hidden knowledge, the hidden knowledge of the Sufis is not something strange. It's not something uh, that is um, outside of Islam, like I said last week. The hidden knowledge of the Sufis is a branch of the sacred law itself. So it is anything that is in contradiction to the Quran and Sunnah is not is not the hidden knowledge of the Sufis. It's something else. It may it may even be something that is um, that leads someone astray. Uh, when I would be lying and that we seek Allah's refuge from that. And also, he also said um, he also said. Um, and the Muqaddima, after he had mentioned what was previously mentioned, that the scholar of the spiritual path had, had legislated in the path obligations, prohibitions, dislike matters, etc. Um, he said the Mujtahid's obligating by his legal deduction something that was not clearly obligated in the sacred law is no more appropriate than the saints obligating a matter that was not clearly obligated in the sacred law, 
just as was clarified by Yafiri and others. So here, here again, uh, we're talking, uh, subhanAllah, about a uh, the scholar of the sacred law and the scholar of the spiritual path. Uh, they are not, when they are deriving rulings, they are not, they are not going against anything that is explicitly stated in the sacred law. Not anything that is explicitly stated in the Quran, not anything that is explicitly stated in the, the Sunnah. So they are obligating things um, because of their uh, intuition or their, after they, uh, they investigate the matter, their intuition tells them that this is most likely a, an obligation because of something uh, that they that comes in the Quran because of something that comes in the Quran. Um, so we'll 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 um, to give an example of this, the um, the scholars of the Sufis derived that it is a personal obligation to purify the heart from the ayah of um, Surah Al, uh, the, the ayah of, from, um, uh, from Surah Al uh, A'la, uh, Qad Aflah, no, it's, uh, this is Surah, this is not Surah Al A'la, this is um, another Surah, um, but it is from the ayah Qad Aflah Man Zakkaha in the ayah Wa Qad Akhab Man Dasaha. So, um, uh, speaking about the nafs, this is from Surah Shams. Uh, speaking about the um, the nafs, Allah said that you know somebody who purifies it will have will be uh, will have success, and the person who uh, leaves it or lets it have its way will be a loser and will be destroyed. So this is from this they derived that is a personal obligation, you know, the, without Allah directly saying you must purify yourself. So this this is what he's saying is that they um, the mushtahs obligate things by their legal deductions that were not le obligated in the sacred law, and so the saint does the same thing. Through his uh, his inspiration, he derives rulings like it is a personal obligation to purify yourself. And so he continues, that is because they all drew conclusions from the clear legislative texts, acquiring knowledge from their splendid illuminated sciences. So just as the mujtahids, may Allah be pleased with them, drew countless rulings and conclusions from the legislative texts, Similarly, these scholars have of hidden knowledge and imams of the spiritual path also drew countless rulings and conclusions regarding the inner realm from leg legislative texts. And all of them did so by way of sound legal reasoning, reasoning. Thus, legal reasoning occurs in the inner realm as well as the outer realm. So what is this? This legal reasoning occurs in the actions related to the outward and the actions related to the apparent world. And they also uh, apply to actions related to the hidden world. And there's no superiority of one over the other. Reality without the sacred law is false. And the sacred law without reality is deficient. And so, like I said, the, the Arifin and the ulama the, the scholars and the, the, the Gnostics, the knowers of God, they are colleagues in the knowledge of, of the sacred. They are just, uh, it's, it's as if, you know, they, they're all colleagues, but each of them has a specialty. Um, so see al yabaqid for more, uh, says the uh, city al Arabi bin Sayyid. And then he, uh, he continues, then both parties, without exception, are drinking from one spring. 
just as none of the sciences of the scholars of the outward sciences fall outside of the sacred law, likewise, the sciences of the scholars of the inner sciences do not fall outside of the sacred law. He further said in the Muqaddimah of, a, of the Tabaqat, how can the knowledge of the people of the inner sciences fall outside of the sacred law when the sacred law was their means to arriving at Allah, exalted is he at every instant. And so this is what I was saying is the hidden knowledge of the Sufis must conform to the sacred law and it will inevitably con conform to the sacred law because the sacred law is their means to uh, connection to the, the, the divine presence. Then it should be clear to you that the hidden knowledge, that hidden knowledge is the quintessence of outer knowledge and the result of acting upon it in the most complete way without it being mixed with desires or defects. For that reason, the Imam of the people, Al-Junaid, may Allah be pleased with him, said, our knowledge is erected upon the book and the Sunnah in refutation of whoever assumes that it falls out of them, or falls outside of them. It's being built upon the book and the Sunnah means that it is the result of acting upon them. So the hidden knowledge is a result of acting upon the Quran and Sunnah with sincerity. The same was said of Shaykh Muhyiddin radiallahu anhu, may Allah be pleased with him. Then he said, with that he separates himself from the masters of the science of derived, sciences of deriving rulings, but only the people of direct experience realize this. So um, uh, Shaykh Muhyiddin is, uh, is uh, He's actually referring to Ibn al-Arabi, al-Hatimi, um, the, the famous Ibn al-Arabi, may Allah be pleased with him. And uh, he, he's speaking in his, uh, his usual um, cryptic way. But basically, he, he is saying that, you know, the, the, the knowledge of the Sufis is built upon acting upon the, the Quran and the Sunnah, and that the person who had gains knowledge of the Quran and Sunnah and then acts upon it, separates himself from the people of, who derive rulings because, because he is acting upon his knowledge while they uh, remain in the world of only deriving rulings or theoretical, um, theoretical knowledge. So his is actualized knowledge while theirs is theoretical knowledge. And that is not, a, that is not to say uh, that one is better than the other. That is to say that this is the difference between their knowledge. It's not, it's not something that in, in makes him superior, but he separates himself, himself by becoming a person of actualized knowledge instead of theoretical knowledge. Uh, Ibn, uh, Imam Ibn uh, uh, Al-Arab Ibn Sayyid uh, continues, I say, there is an indication in the assertion of built upon um, of the Imam of the people uh, of Imam Junaid, may Allah be pleased with him. Uh, this, this indication is of the lofty status of inner knowledge and the nobility of its standing in terms of its being the marrow, the marrow in, in like bone marrow, the marrow of the sacred law and its quintessence. So the, the knowledge of the people of the path is the, uh, the marrow, the, the marrow. Um, so this is an expression um, that the, uh, the, 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 um, the Arabs use, the marrow of something. Uh, the, the bone marrow is the innermost part of the bone and it is the most, you know, it is the most important part and the most supple part. Um, so the, he's saying that their knowledge is, is the innermost and, and the, the um, choicest part of the sacred law. The author of al Waqit um, mentioned something that supports him where he said, I have seen in the books of Riyaya, um, of Riyaya, of Sheikh Izzuddin Abdus Salam, the chief of the scholars of Egypt of his time, the following, all people sat upon the carpet of the sacred law, but the Sufi sat upon its foundation that does not waver. 
So um, basically the scholars, all of them are, on, are in the domain of the sacred law, but the Sufis found its fa the foundation, its most solid foundation, and they sat upon it. Then he continued after that. It has been related to us that Sheikh Izzeddin had been saying before that, does there exist any, a, a, any way to the sacred law other than these narrations which we have? Whoever believes that an, an inner knowledge of the sacred law exists, aside from what narrations we possess, he is a batini approaching apostasy. Then we, when he met with Sheikh Abu Hassan al-Shadili in Egypt, and took from him, he began praising the people of the path with every type of praise. And he started to say, it is a path which has gathered the manners of the messengers. And so um, <coughs> considering um, saying that, uh, that the, uh, considering that anyone who says that there's inner knowledge is a bad thing is not something new. And um, basically, uh, this was the opinion of Sheikh Izzeddin uh, Ibn Abdul Salam until he met Abu Hassan al Shadili and took his hand. And so, it, basically, uh, there is knowledge that is not related um, in in the uh, in the the narrations and and is knowledge that is born in the hearts of the men of Allah, but this knowledge uh, always returns back to the Quran and Sunnah. And I'll, I'll finish with this excerpt. Um, uh, Imam al-Sha'rani said, it continued, and the proof of Islam, al-Ghazali, used to say something similar to what Ibn Abdul Salam used to say, but when he met the Sufis and experienced their path, he started to say, we had been idling our entire lives. And this is an important uh, section right here because he's going to vindicate the scholars and he's, he's going to actually come back to and say this, that the people of, of the past, when they make these statements, they are not disparaging the scholars of outward sciences. Um, so he said that we had been idling our entire lives that is due to the knowledge uh, on the path of the um, the knowledge on the path of the people of disputation consists of in terms of speaking more than acting. So he he said this because the the theoretical knowledge consists of more speech than action. But the truth is that one who is occupied with that knowledge, one who is occupied with knowledge, is never idle. So subhanAllah, he, he actually brought it back and, and uh, because we as uh, people of, uh, as novices and students, we may take this to the extreme and say, oh, you know, the, he's, the Sufis say the, the scholars aren't, aren't, don't, they're, they're not important or they're not doing anything. Well, this is not true. So this is not what the people were saying. What they were saying is they were comparing their state before they took the path and their state after they took the path. And their state after they took the path was only because of the knowledge that they had before they took the path, because they began to act upon the knowledge that they had before. And so they gained the, the state that they had after the path. And so this is, this is, um, this is what uh, Imam Sha'rani is saying is saying he said that because the the knowledge of the people of disputation consists of speaking more than acting, but the truth is that one who is occupied with knowledge is never idle. Instead, it is the foundation of the path. The knowledge that that knowledge is the foundation of the path because part of the concern of the people of the path is that the book in Sunnah Sunnah scrutinize or the book in Sunnah judge all of their movements and stationary periods, all of their states of movement and, and stillness. And so, the, you know, he brought it back to, yes, there, this knowledge of the people of the people of the path, this knowledge of the Sufis 
is the is the cream of the knowledge of the sacred law. But the knowledge of the sacred law that the scholars have is the foundation of that knowledge. And gaining the knowledge of the of the scholars and then acting upon that knowledge with the guidance of the Sufis is the way to get to the cream, which is the knowledge of the Sufis. But only the one who dives into the depths of, of Hadith and Quranic exegesis, the uh, Quranic explanation really knows this. And this is this saying of Al-Ghazali is only something that emanated from him in his state of passionate love for the people of the path. And the ruling of the passionate lover is the same as that of the drunkard. And if he had complete, contemplated his state, he would know that what he what we said was true, what he said was true, that jurisprudence that what we said is true, that jurisprudence is the foundation of the path, and that the upshot or the the um, the apex of the Sufis is that uh, of the, the the summary of what a Sufi is is that he is none other than a scholar who acts upon his knowledge, and so. Um, the, the hidden knowledge of the Sufis is the result of gaining outward knowledge and acting upon it while paying attention to the states of the heart. And this is the point of this, uh, this particular section. Um, so that, that's the end of what we're going to do tonight. Um, and I'm going to turn it over to, to uh, Sidi Amin. Wa sallallahu ta'ala wa Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala wa sahbihi wa sallam. Subhana Rabbi Rabbil Azati Amma Yasifun wa Salaamu Ala Al-Mursani wa Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Sidi Amin, do you want to take it and, and take any questions? Uh, yes, Sidi. Alhamdulillah. Uh, thanks for the session. Uh, it was really good and deep as, as always. Um, you cover a lot of, uh, you know, like taboos and uh, misconceptions, which is very important because uh, a lot of people, sometimes I feel like even from my own uh, personal experience and my friends, whoever, like, you know, they they, uh, they understand that, you know, there is something, you know, and the heart knows that there is a spiritual journey. But because of the kind of misconceptions and the the wrong kind of um, view of the tariqa and the society, the people just keep away from it. And this class is is really good for it. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we now have uh, some questions. So I would like to um, share with you. <clears throat> Let me read to you the first question. Um for example, uh, when we receive divine dreams or increase in knowledge or uh, spiritual openings, uh, how do we remain humble or check ourselves for pride? <laughs> um, we have to uh, always... So, so this returns to uh, the, the path of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam the path of the Muhammadan tariqas is the path of shukr. And so shukr is, is to, is, uh, it means gratefulness or, or thankfulness. However, thankfulness, according to us, is that we use whatever blessing Allah gives us to worship Allah. And so it, to keep yourself humble is just to remit to, um, take it back to Allah. Know that everything is from Allah, and it's not from you. It's not to you. It's not from you, and it and it doesn't belong to you. And so this is how you 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 try to remain humble, and you try to um, try to remember that every blessing is from Allah, and that you owe Him thanks for that blessing. And so this will this will help, um, but also you know keeping contact with a knower of God, and or you know or a sheikh who is humble and who who is selfless will help you to to realize that that uh, that humility because that is something humility is something that um, is transferred from the heart to heart is not something that you just, you, you know, most of us, we get something and we attribute it to ourselves. Most of us, we don't want to admit it, but you know, we have, we have caught one in us, you know, oh, oh, this came to me because of some knowledge that I have, or oh, this came to me because I did this, 
No, this came to you as pure grace from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so keeping the, the company of people who can remind you of that is a big means to, to uh, staying humble. Alhamdulillah, it was a really beautiful answer. Um, I think those who have, uh, you know, a little bit, you know, a little bit of experience, they can, you know, they'll be quite aware of what you're saying. Like, you know, in the beginning, we're always like, we're very careful, we're humble, but after some time, we feel the seniority seeping in and we start to forget our roots and the things that we should check ourselves. Abdullah, thank you for the beautiful answer. Uh, since you mentioned about, um, you know, keeping uh, in touch with Oshie, uh, you know, for Allah, someone is humble, who will be to guide you. Um, I like to push forward this question to you. I feel like it somehow links to the first question. Uh, so some of my friends want to join uh, Tarika because the Sheikh has been close with their family and their community. Um, so they want to join the Tarika because of that, of course, of their affiliation. Although the Sheikh has passed on, uh, what is your advice, Sheikh? Is it important to be with a living Sheikh? Um, so the, the, the reality is that has been debated. Um, that has been debated amongst many, many uh, Arifin. And um, most of the Arifin said that it's necessary to have a living Sheikh. Um, but there, there are people who travel the path of Sheikhs who are not, you know, who are not in, the, uh, in, the, in this realm. However, this, this, this is something that is intrinsic to Tariqa Tijaniya and that the Sheikh remains Sheikh Ahmed Tijani radiallahu anhu. Mm -hmm. And all of the people who we know as Sheikh, they are really only representing him in this realm. And so there are people thought be other people who, who have permission, but the Sheikh is still, you know, has passed on. And so it's not it's not something that is um, that is absolutely necessary. However, if someone wants tarabia, wants spiritual education, which is its purpose is to enter him or her in the divine presence and grant him, you know, whatever Mahdi for Allah has for him or her, then if this person wants that, then it, this is most li likely to come to a living sheikh. Is most likely to come to a living sheikh. And if they can't find a living sheikh, then, you know, if they, they just want the, the barakah of being connected to a hadara, then there's, there's no problem with taking a tariqa if the sheikh has passed on. You know, if that's, if it's barakah. But if, if he wants to enter the divine presence, then I think that is better. I think it's better to have a living sheikh or a living guide. Okay. Thank you, uh, Imam Talut. Um, Alhamdulillah. So um, another question that was put forward. Uh, so let me read it out to you. Salam, Imam Talut. Uh, you mentioned about hidden knowledge and its importance. Uh, how do Murids reconcile hidden knowledge with its actual practice and embodiment? Isn't it a proof against oneself to know such hidden knowledge with the impression one has reached a certain maqam, yet not truly embody it in reality? So how does a Murid protect oneself from such pitfalls of the nafs? Um, so again, this is something that is... You know, I'm a murid, so I'm not a sheikh. Um, the the uh, best thing, you know, the, is to know your state. Um, so, and not to hasten any condition that Allah has not willed for you at the time. Uh, sheikh Ahmed Tijani, who was asked by one of his murids, he wanted to go into khalwa because of some problems he had with his nafs. And so the Sheikh said to him, you know, if you are able to do such and such a thing, and, and they were very um, strict requirements. And he said, if your nafs has no rejection to these strict requirements, then go do khalwa. 
if when reading these strict requirements, you have, you know, some objection from your nafs, then know that the situation that Allah has you in is the right situation for you at this time. And so um, basically my advice is uh, aside from, you know, seeking the advice of the Sheikh is that whatever Allah blesses you with of, of some knowledge, then you consider it a blessing of Allah and you worship Allah in the state, you know, try to do as much worship and, and be as sincere to Allah in whatever state that you're in, you know, and, you know, if you, if you do that, then Sheikh Abba Janwari and who said that, you know, Allah will bring you out at the time that he has, he has appointed, he will bring you out from that state and into a more perfect state. And so, and, and this is my advice. This is, this is from Sheikh Ahmed Dijani Rani and you know, I'm a Murid who I think has the same problems as, that are being described. So um, I, I, I think I should answer from what the Sheikh said and, and leave it there. <laughs> okay, Alhamdulillah, thanks for sharing. It was very um, insightful for us to be humble always. Uh, we always uh, kind of uh, overlook this as we start to progress. We feel like we are progressing in the path. Uh, Alhamdulillah, I think this will be um, the last question for this session. So uh, some people claim to meet Hidr and start to do their own spiritual things and making, uh, making people feel they are special. Somehow I feel he is delusional and people around him misunderstand Tasawuf. So how do we go about this uh, Imam? Do we take uh, what he said openly uh, about whatever he received from Khidir, uh, Khidir alayhi salam? So that is the question, Imam. Okay, so when someone claims to have hidden knowledge, then um, we return it to the Sharia. If he's your sheikh, that's a different story. But if he's, you know, just someone you know, or imam in the area, or then, you know, um, whatever he says, you know, it is, it's, if it's not something from Allah or Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, or, uh, the ruling of this madhab is, or Sheikh so and so says, if it's not something that he can relate from uh, from from other people of the past, then we we avoid we don't we don't deny it. Maybe he he does have some knowledge, but it's not obligatory for anybody else. So what's obligatory for everybody else is you know to follow the madhab. To follow Quran, follow and su follow follow Sunnah, you know, and and adhere to what the scholars have have put in place, or have derived of, of the sacred law. This is what is obligatory for everybody. If someone has hidden knowledge, you know, we don't know. We can't. You can't say, "Oh, I can confirm that he has hidden knowledge or that he speaks with Khidr, unless you see Khidr with him, and Khidr is not a guide for the for the Mohammedan saints. You know, if you if you actually read the encounters, um, especially Tijani um, encounters with Khidr, uh, Khidr radiallahu anhu, he, he actually, alayhi salam, he, he came to one of the, the Muris of Shaykh Ahmed Tijani radiallahu anhu, and the Muri was sweeping a masjid. And he came to him and, and you know, the, the Murid saw him, but he kept sweeping the masjid. And he said, you know, don't you, don't you know who I am? And he said, yes. But my loyalty to Sheikh Ahmed to Jani, you know, who prevents me from, from being inclined to anyone else. So these, these things, you know, Khidr is not a guide for the, for the Mohammedan saints. The Mohammedan saints, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the guide and the saints within this ummah are, are the guide. So if he's getting knowledge from, from him, he may get knowledge from him, but he should keep it to himself and he should act upon it himself. He doesn't impose it on anyone else. And for anyone else, it's not obligatory. Okay. 
the um, was insightful. Uh, so it was it was very refreshing for you to you know um, when we heard it to say that Hidri is not a guy from Hamadan Saints and also for us to always um, way back um, in the scale of Sharia. Uh, and I believe um, also we have heard a lot of uh, imams, even the big Shay and imams have always mentioned this thing, including Shay behind me us. And yeah, so Alhamdulillah, um, I think we have uh, covered all the questions for tonight. Uh, once again, it was very insightful. And you know, like um, I really like how this class touches on a lot of uh, taboo questions and you know, it clears the doubts. Alhamdulillah, it's like, uh, session of removal of confusion itself also. So yeah, um, inshallah, uh, I think I would like to have uh, uh, Imam Talut to say a closing dua okay. for this session. Yeah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Qul huwa Allahu ahadu Allahu samad lam yalidu wa lam yuladu wa lam yakul lahu kufu wa anahad. Allahumma alim, Allahumma Allah, we, we ask you by the love of your Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and by the love of your awliya that you have placed in our hearts, we ask you to guide us upon the path of the awliya, to guide us upon the path of acting upon the Quran and Sunnah. Um, and we ask you to always keep us uh, sincere to this path and to make our, uh, our concentration in our direction one in this path and mm -hmm. to cause us to arrive at you in the best of conditions and to grant us afia, to grant us well-being mm -hmm. in this world and the next. Alhamdulillah, thank you um, so much, Imam Talut. Uh, inshallah, we will uh, see you again uh, next week. Inshallah, inshallah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi Okay guys, alhamdulillah. Um, it was another beautiful session. Uh, we're really grateful to have this sacred text series from a lot of uh, people who are well trained in this traditional path uh, to share with us about the reality of the religion and about the spiritual journey to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So right now, um, I would just like to um, share some updates. Tonight, we have uh, Sheikh uh, Musa Penfound. We'll be coming live at uh, 6 p.m. Sorry, not tonight, but today evening. Yeah. So yeah, tonight uh, you can see Sheikh Musa Penfound, he'll be touching on uh, patience and perseverance, Ramadan in times of uh, pandemic, uh, tonight at 6 p.m. And tomorrow at 9 p.m. we'll have Sheikh Abdul Aziz on disciplining the soul. Uh, he'll be touching about uh, being rid of uh, contentment. And this session with Sheikh Abdul Aziz Fredericks will be based on um, the Ihya Ulumuddin of uh, Imam Ghazali. So today and uh, tonight and tomorrow, please tune in. And last but not least, I'm sure uh, most of you all um, caught our live concert yesterday with a lot of local and international artists and poets. You know, it was very soulful. You all can go back and uh, listen again. Uh, we had about eight to ten artists. Mashallah, it was very nice. You know, very lively. We got to taste um, all the different flavors of uh, the Ummah, you know, they all give uh, their personal touch in the poetry, in their, in their songs and their kasidas. Alhamdulillah. So you can go back and check the concert again. Um, and also, please help us to share the information about our project, about uh, build, uh, building hospital in Senegal. Uh, as you all know, in this pandemic, it's like even more important uh, for this necessity for the Africans um, in this time. There's about 25,000 people just in the village that we are building. And inshallah, uh, and the surrounding villages, there are about 130,000 people who will benefit from this project. Uh, don't think like you can't do much. Even a small contribution will go a long way. Even uh, if they can just give $50 or $25, don't worry, you can just give it. 
and please spread the message to your friends and loved ones. Inshallah, we can do this together. We have been on this project for three years with all your support and love and dua. And inshallah, we will continue to strive hard for this project. So with that, um, I'd like to close today's Sacred Tech series and today's uh, wonderful session. Uh, have a good uh, Saturday afternoon with your loved ones. Alhamdulillah, please stay safe and stay home. Thank you very much.